Hello, and thank you for tuning in. This is the Paranormal 60 Presents this season on Ghosts of Devil's Perch. Our recap episode for episode four, Help Us. We'll do that with our special guests, Katie Stafford and Chris Cagle, when we return to the best in paranormal programming. This is the Paranormal 60. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps... Baloney, perhaps not. Ghosts of Devil's Perch, new episodes every Sunday on Travel Channel and Discovery Plus. And I want to thank you all. You are helping to do tremendous things with our ratings. We are getting a lot of you tuning in and checking out the show in the first 24 to 48 hours, just like Uncle Dave taught you. So thank you very much for doing that and for being a part of it. Uh, We've got a lot to cover on this episode and uh, a lot to talk about. Help Us is the name of the episode. We visit the famous Dumas Brothel, which has been covered on many different paranormal shows, but we felt that this was a hub, a center point, and a location we definitely needed to check into and examine. You're gonna have to forgive me, folks. For some reason, our air conditioning in my house has decided to stop working, so my glasses are gonna continue to fog because I'm fired up about today's program. Joining me, on this program, my good friend and field producer from both the Holzer Files and now the Ghosts of Devil's Perch, Chris Cagle. Good to see you, Chris. Good to see you too, Dave. Well, <laughs> I, I love that picture. You, the, the picture you put up of me, like I'm, I'm, I'm dying. You got like the handlebar mustache. Oh, you look! Look at how handsome you are in that image. Look at that! Boom! <laughs> I like it. You are a good-looking fella. I'm glad that you're able to join us. It's great when we can have somebody come in that has a different perspective and working behind the scenes. And uh, Katie Stafford will be joining us in a few minutes, but I had a few questions uh, directed towards you that I've gotten from our listeners over time as the person working behind the scenes and putting these shows together. Uh, As a field producer, can you kind of describe what that means in the sense of, of, (laughs) I know it's, it's hard to put it because you're kind of a a Johnny go late. You do everything, but what, what is the main aspect of of your position on a program like this um well you know it's funny it's it changes from from day to day um but on this particular show i was kind of putting together uh, our shooting schedules especially on the days where like we're shooting you know after you know an event that happened during a baseline investigation or the real investigation like you know i'm gathering information and putting together the schedule on how we're going to shoot it and present this information to uh, to the masses or, you know, for, for camera. Um, you know, I'm also constantly in communication with you, Cindy and KD, just kind of giving you guys the plan on, on what's happening. Um, you know, a lot of times I'm the one reaching out to you guys when we need you to hurry up and get out and, you know, we got to go and, <laughs> you know, see what's popping off. Um, and then, you know, I'm also, I also did a lot of, well, actually I did most of the casting um, for the reenactments, you know. Um, Wait a minute, just... casting <laughs> on a reality <laughs> show. On a reality show, there is acting involved in this. There, there is a bit of there is a bit of acting. Yes, and, and, and I've got proof I... yeah. right here. There he is, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Richard Sims. You recognize him. You love him from the Cabbage Patch. Chris Epis- Cagle yeah. was Richard Sims. Pretty remarkable, huh? We had a great, uh, we had a great makeup <laughs> and special effects people. Uh, th- thank you for showing that, Dave. Of course. <laughs> but yeah, so you know, oh, there it is again. <laughs> yeah. You know, we um, with this show, there's a lot of historical um, information that comes at us, and you know, we're the kind of show right. that kind of we like to kind of visualize what those stories are when they're being told on camera, you know, and that requires. Right acting so you know we really 
did our best to bring the town in a butte into this. And, you know, I would hold casting calls on Sundays to, you know, fit these roles of the people's stories that we we're trying to tell on the show. Um, you know, and then we had a great, we, you know, we had, uh, his name was Brian down in uh, the middle of butte. He had this great costume antique shop. He costumed yes. everything on the show, almost 90% of it. So shout out to him. Um, but yeah, I approved all of that. I approved, uh, you know, it was like, you know, Patrick Duffy's head gets crushed on a train. Like, what are we going to do? So, you know, I was heavily right. involved in bringing those visuals to life. Also, paying and you attention did a to phenomenal job. Oh, thank you. I love that aspect. And we had that in Holzer Files and now bringing it over to Ghost mm -hmm. of Devil's Perch is I love that there is a more cinematic feel to these episodes and that doesn't mean it's being acted or, or portrayed in a false way in right. any way but they have to tell the story between the stories showing right. you the reenactments and I, I love that they're done in such a, a high profile way you and our showrunner brian uh did a phenomenal job of making sure that this clicked and worked well and uh, i applaud you because a lot of people tell me how gorgeous the episodes are and it does have that vibe and i know it's because uh, the two of you helped to bring that while we were there on set. But you also, yeah, you that. help us in collecting um, the people. Like when we're, we're Ellen Baumgartner, yes. right? <clears throat> yes. When, when yes. we're going to go sit down with somebody, you're the one that once Fisk gives us these names, you source them to make sure they're going to be okay and want to talk about the paranormal or talk about what we're doing, correct? Absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, that are a little leery about, you know, um, dealing with the paranormal side of, of history. Um, right. But, you know, we are a show that wants and loves to tell the real stories. So yeah, it's a lot of that. Like, you know, Fisk gives us a couple names, people will reach out, you know, we reach out to them. You know, we have to give them the premise of the show and, you know, the kind of information we're looking for. Um, because again, as you've said on your show, because I do watch your show, Dave, um, we have a lot coming at us, you know what I mean? Um, not mm -hmm. all of it gets to make the show, you know, Cindy has a lot coming at her, even if it makes sense, it doesn't always make sense with, you know, with what we're trying to do in 42 minutes. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's talking to the people that, um, that are having hauntings, hauntings like the Finks, you know, I was, I'm actually, I still talk to Barb Fink today, you know, just, I was kind of the point person in, 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 in keeping their situation calm and, you know, talking them through it and just, you know, aside from you guys, obviously, um, I had a lot of contact with, with them also. So, well, let's, I mentioned it on last week's episode because a lot of people were like, oh my God, the Fink family said they'd never return if they felt <laughs> frightened. And then you guys never really talk about it at the end of the episode. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give us a sense? How are the Finks doing after our visit? I mean, I know, but I'd like, I'd like our audience to hear from the guy who's boots on the ground and keeps in touch with them on a more yeah. regular basis. Uh, the Finks are, you know, they, they're doing really, really well. Um, mm -hmm. They've had, a, they've had, a, they had a tragedy over the past, right. you know, past year. Um, and they also moved. <laughs> did they really? Yes, but not, not for that reason. They did not move because of that. Okay. Um, they, yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> but no, they're Damn doing, it, I'd have bought doing, that house. Yeah. Katie no, and I would have bought it and made it our new center house. HQ. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's the other thing too, like, um, it's tough to see, you know, the scope of some of these locations that we're at, you know, in 42 minutes. Right. And, you know, we're really kind of focused on the spots that are like popping off, but like some of these places are so much bigger than right. what you guys see on TV. I mean, even the Fink house, you know, it was, a, it's a small house, but it had levels to it and layers to it. Um, but uh, what was the question again? Oh, the things are oh, doing great. Asking, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. She, she and she really, really loved the episode. And again, they did not move because of the spirits in the house. That's um, good. Yeah, uh, but no, they're doing great. Well, I'm going to be in Butte for the season finale. Keep watching this program and checking darknessevents.com, darknessevents.com, and I'll update all of you, the viewers. So if you're in and around the Butte area and you'd like to come out and meet, I'll be there all weekend long. I'll be doing some of the trolley tours with, with Fisk. I'll be hanging out. Uh, we're going to do a large screening of the season finale, and I'll be doing a Q&A. And I just really wanted to get a chance to go back into Butte and see the people, see the town, and 
give a chance for the people that were so kind and open to us to have a chance to communicate. So I'm going to be there for that. And uh, maybe, maybe Chris, I might have to to vibe you and Katie and Cindy and everybody in on, on video calls for a few minutes to, to address the crowd. I would love that, man. Like the, the people of Butte, they were, they were awesome people to, yeah. uh, to be around. They were very, very resourceful, very happy to have the team there and helping them kind of get down to the bottom of, you know, what was going on there. So uh, great relationship with everybody there. Do you ever run into with this uh, or the Holzer files doing the job that you do and, and having to approach these people? Do you get much pushback? Are there many people that are like, no, I'm not going to talk about that. That's that'll ruin my career, especially when you're dealing with historians and mm -hmm. people of that ilk that, you know, they've written books. Ellen Baumgartner wrote books. But is it something she wants to share? I mean, you have to be very ginger, I would guess, but let them know fully full well that we are doing something paranormal. We're talking about the ghosts and the, the right. haunted history of this town. Right. right. Um, yeah. You know, there are people that, and it's not that they don't believe it, you know, and they would totally talk to us off the record, but you know, some people are just like, like, Ooh, as far as like getting, getting a camera on their face and telling us the stories right. that they want to tell us, you know, we, we I have gotten pushback and then I've gotten, um, I've gotten people who are semi-cooperative. It's just like they agree to come on to the show and talk about the history that's directly related to the haunting or that could be directly related to the haunting. But they won't really talk about the haunting part of it, but they will mm -hmm. you know, give us the facts um, and, and the historical aspects that we're looking for. So you know, there's some people who go right in and they'll talk about all of it and that they saw something and there's other people who are just like, you know, we're not really comfortable talking about the ghost part of it, but we can totally talk about the history and the events that could have led to what is happening. <clears throat> I want to address one more thing with the Fink family. It was something that's fun. Uh, and again, here's, I always like to tell these behind the scenes stories and this of course from last episode, but one of the tough jobs Chris has to do is make sure that all of us in the stable are doing what we're there to do. And I felt when we're sitting at the picnic <laughs> table talking to the Fink family, um, it's very tense. And I've got this little girl there and I, I keep saying little girl, she was very petite, but she was a teenage girl. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I wanted to be sensitive to, to them. So while we're talking, so we'd have to stop a lot because Butte is filled with trucks and brrr, noises. Oh <laughs> our I our would, sound guy would lose it. Uh, I would joke around with the family to try to loosen them up because everybody looks so tense. And I didn't, as much as I want to approach what's going on, I was trying to keep it. I, Chris comes over to me at one point. He goes, uh... Dave, I need you to ease up on being so friendly and sweet to these people and just tell them what's going on because they're just, you're telling them terrifying things and they've got these huge smiles on their face. And it's not that we're looking for false um, reactions, but it's right. I mean, when you're telling them these things and their reaction is smiling because two minutes ago I was joking around and trying to lighten the mood. You know, it, it you have a lot, I give you a lot of credit, you and the guys and gals behind the scenes because they've got to keep us on task. And I know on Holzer Files, uh, Shane and I would cut up a lot and you guys would have to shut us down. Come on, guys. Come on. And we're like, this is how we, you know, our personalities are mm -hmm. right. But Dr. Holzer's a serious guy. You can't be dicking around all the time and, and uh, joking. So we'd reel it back in. So you guys have got a hundred balls in the air that you're juggling, making sure everybody shows yeah. up on time, getting things done, getting from us what you need uh, to make sure that everything is cohesive for the storyline. Um, and I've always appreciated the, uh, freedom that you give guys like Katie and myself and Cindy uh, to do what we do and then rein us in. Um, people will see these scenes and, and they'll go, Oh, you know what? Kate, I could tell you and Katie are acting. You're, you're delivering those lines. And we're like, that's because they asked me, all right, Dave, what just happened? And they want me to say, I was just part of an experiment that absolutely terrified me. Right. That's what they want to hear from me. And what I say is blah, 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 terrified me, blah, 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 blah. 20 minutes later, Chris is like, can we go back to that? I was, yeah, in an experiment that terrified me. And then you have to say that line. So 
as far as acting on a paranormal show, that's the acting because we have to go back and repeat lines once in a while that got ruined by trucks or planes or dogs or, or, you know, microphones getting blown by the wind or the fact that we ramble for 20 minutes when we really need to be succinct and give you a one, you know, chunk because we have to fit in so much. And when the explanation Mm -hmm. is 20 minutes in a 42 minute episode, it's tough. It's tough to to pull this together. So you guys do a great job. Speaking of doing a great job, ladies and gentlemen, our own mad man and mad scientist. Oh, paranormal there he is. Oh. He is here. What's <laughs> up, buddy? Man, Chris, hey. Dave. How are you, KD? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm great. Good to see you. Good. Good to see you, too. Good to talk to you. Um, you know, and, and just to finish what you were just saying, Dave, you know, Yes, you know, these guys have their own personalities and we love it, we get it, but you know, there's sometimes we have to think about what we're looking for tonally, you know. Mm-hmm. So we we do make them go back and be like, say that again, but you know, we need you to, you know, bring down the jovialness a, a little bit. Um, oh, yeah. you know, so but but again, these guys are hundred percent professionals and everything that's happening out there is happening for real. We are making a, t- a TV show, so we will ask him to repeat something again. Those trucks in Butte, yeah, I can't stress it shorter, enough. But yeah, can we, yeah, but shorter, <laughs> more concise. Yeah. Um, and then the, you know the trucks in Butte are just you know, and not we're not talking like Mack trucks. We're talking about people with pickup trucks that have these crazy exhaust systems. I figured and, it out. Um, it's a tax incentive to not have a muffler on your car. Really? I don't know. <laughs> Katie's trying to give them some reasonable doubt for how damn loud yeah. their town is. Yeah. All right. So this episode, we we launch off to the Dumas brothel. In most of these cases, we're being called in, but we felt like this has always been a hub, a center point of this town. So we made a just a, a random call out to David Prince, the owner, to see, hey, all these places are having this activity. How are things going at the Dumas? And that was one of the calls on on your plate, Chris, uh, to mm-hmm. to get put those feelers out. When I said, "Hey, maybe we should check it out," was he amiable from the start? Because you watch in the episode, you can see he's kind of hesitant, almost like he wants help, but he's afraid to poke the bear. Yeah, um, I remember even my first conversation with him. He sounded very nervous on the phone, mm-hmm. but not nervous to let you guys in just kind of nervous about what is going on there and and what could pop off bringing you guys there bringing the 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 energy of the production there you know like um so yeah david was um david was nervous he was nervous the entire time you know from start to finish well and and that they've had other productions that come in there. And I'm not slighting mm-hmm. anybody, but they come in. Productions come in with different senses and feelings and desires for what they're hoping to get. But they're not always about necessarily helping spirits. Right. And right. and he was very concerned because he wanted to make sure that we weren't going to just come in and poke at the hornet's nest, get everything mm-hmm. lit up. And then Katie, <laughs> Sydney, and I are on the next bus home, right? Um, right. He wanted to make sure that this wasn't going to be something that was A, going to affect him or his business or the people that come to visit him there. Right. Right. And, you know, again, like you, you stated, you know, our, our goal was, our goal was never, and your goal was never to poke any bear, but you know, you guys are trying to get down to the bottom of stuff. And we have been hearing about, you know, the Dumas brothel since we got into town. I mean, I'm sure we've all heard of it even before getting to Butte, right. how haunted the location is. Um, but um, you know, you guys just were looking for answers, and you know, no, no poking of any bears happened. <laughs> so no, well, no bear poking zone, right? This at is, least, at this least for is, us. This place stood out to me because you know when we go in for a baseline, um, you know, you're there to really, really kind of hear the history, to see what's going on, and here we are. We're talking to David Prince as he's taking us to these locations where things have happened. And as you watch in the episode, I'm standing with my back to the one door and I'm very clearly hearing footsteps walking around in the room. And I kept turning to KD and he's nodding because you don't want to, David Prince is telling us a story and something that's going on. You don't want to interrupt his flow, but I'm, I'm looking for some kind of acknowledgement that I'm not going nuts. And I'm looking at, at KD and he's giving me the nod and the eyebrow and he's hearing it. And then I get that 
<sighs> over my neck as David is explaining what's going on in this place. On the baseline investigation, that's right. crazy. But then KD doing what he does, he brings out now explain to me that camera. What how it's a thermal camera, but it's not the video style camera people are used to, like a FLIR, correct? Right. Yeah. It, uh, it, uh, it does basically, well, it's a flare. It's, it's a flare C2 compact, um, thermal camera. And so right. it's the size of a cell phone. And, uh, so I can take pictures and I can look at the actual picture and then compare it to the thermal also. And yeah, I was just walking through snapping pictures and, um, I just happened to snap that one in that room with that figure. And, uh, yeah, we checked it out. We checked that room out and there was like no way uh, it was, it could have been anything else. I mean, uh, there was nothing in there that would have uh, mimicked the shape of a person, you know? Yeah. Well, and as we're doing it and Katie is popping off pictures, the flash goes off and I happened to be looking at that door. And when the flash went off, I could have sworn I saw a black shadowy figure in the door frame and then when he flat because you notice in the scene he's like pop 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 the second third time he starts doing it i'm not getting anything so i do have this to show this was the initial shot and you'll just see the door is pretty bland there's nothing there to see and uh i get a close-up of it here it is so that you can see again nothing really in the door there's just you can see in the behind it and then KD pops off the next shot, and there is very clearly a full figure standing in the door frame, watching back out towards us. And uh, these have been lightened up. Uh, now that we've got them off the show, we've lightened them up just so you can see a little bit better, especially for those of you watching the video podcast. For those of you listening to the video podcast, go over to the Paranormal 60 YouTube channel. Watch this episode. You'll see what, what we're talking about. But KD this is what we're used to seeing, right? You just kind of get these greenish gray rooms. When you right. go pop that next picture off and we see a figure in there and you could see it outlined. I, I got to know from your perspective as an investigator and, and your love of technology, how big a holy beep moment was this for you? Oh, it was a huge holy uh, beep moment. Because, <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, is uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the thermal, image that was you know accompanied that didn't have right there was nothing in it so it's like um you know we we expect as investigators and using all this equipment we expect you know i wasn't expecting to get a picture in the regular image i was expecting to get a, a you know some sort of thermal well let's explain that too so you said it's it's about the size of a like a cell phone mm -hmm. it's taking multi-layered pictures right it's taking a regular picture night vision and thermal yeah. And as we scroll through the other options, there's nothing there. But in that kind of night vision version is the only one that shows. So we're looking into a, a specific spectrum of light, but it was putting off no heat, which, again, would be exactly what we'd expect. Or, or not, a, not even a cold spot. It was just yeah. room temperature all the way around <laughs> it. So and there was absolutely nothing between me and the flash. And if you look at the door frame, you can go you can figure it's about five and a half, six feet tall. Yeah. And then we go immediately over there. That will, I, I'm going to be honest with you guys, again, doing the behind the scenes, because it was so quick when you, you and I start walking over there after what had already happened to me at Cabbage Patch and the experience in the Hennessy Mansion on TV, I realized I got to headlong in there. Let's do this. The whole time I'm like, please don't let there be something in that room. Please don't let there be something in that room. Please don't let there be, because I'm walking towards that door and I'm just, it's pure dread because you just feel that heaviness in the mm -hmm. Dumas brothel. Um, and <laughs> that that's the one thing being kind of affected physically and emotionally by earlier episodes. I hate the fact that it starts making me gun shy. I appreciate Katie. You've seen a lot. You've, you've served in the military. You've done all these things. We, we have a job to do, Dave, let's just go. And, and you, you head into it, whether you're worried I'm going to get thrown over the banister or not. <laughs> <laughs> occupational hazards sorry dude. i understand <laughs> <laughs> totally understand but that that was a moment for me that was a very very uncomfortable situation because you know the other thing and let's address it we're all fascinated by the paranormal we all want to see something until mm -hmm. you see something really creepy and then you're like ah, 
I could have lived my whole life without seeing that. So yeah, that's yeah. kind of the other angle is as I'm walking into that room, am I going to see some bloody mess, some horrific character standing in that door frame when we get in there? That's a I'm glad we went in. I'm glad we checked. But it was a it, I was pushing the wall to do that at that point. How did it make you feel, Dave, to see Cindy to hear her say, you know, this thing doesn't like Dave being here? And you weren't even up there when she said that. And you probably yeah. didn't know that she even said that until. Do you, I was going to ask you about that. Do you think that it did not like me specifically because I saw it? Something that slinks in the shadows. And in that brief moment, it wasn't. I, I <clears> saw <throat> it. I physically saw the thing standing in the door frame, And you caught it in that photographic moment. Do you I think, think it you, didn't I like think, being sensed? I think by like uh, whenever it touched you at the cabbage patch, right? I mm -hmm. think now this is just like a theory that I'm kind of developing. I, I didn't really think about it at the time, but it's Wait, seems but one like second, one second. Let's refrain, uh, rephrase. Touch me sounds kind of sweet and romantic. That thing hurt me, <laughs> to me to the ground. I just want right. to, I've been touched nicely well, before. Uh, this well, thing what really I mean, okay, so that. when it, when I, I said it, it touched you, it, it kind of, um, it, you, you may have imprinted on it or, you know, it, it uh, developed some sort of um, detest for you or like it was worried about you for some reason. And so it seemed like from that point forward, there was always something there that was kind of singling you out. I like that you have two options. It either detested you or it was worried about you. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, maybe both. I mean, I, I, I have my theories, but I won't yes. say anything just because um, – just keep watching the show. Just keep watching. Um, but I but I do have my theories about about that. Yikes. Well, yeah. here we get, you know, we get a chance to go sit down uh with Miss Baumgartner. She's written a bunch of books. She has tackled aspects of the paranormal in this and and is open about the concept, but I could tell in my dealing with her in, in conversation, she seemed and I don't know, Chris, maybe you could put uh some light on this. She seemed open to the prospects but almost protective of the spirits there like mm -hmm. i okay you got the name molly yeah there was a molly but it almost seemed like she was reticent to give me too much information like we might i don't know summon her or do i, I don't know what was your take on that um <clears throat> i'm gonna agree that she seemed very protective mm -hmm. of it um I don't know if she thought we were going to, if we were going to summon her, but I think she was still, I think she was kind of in the same mind frame as, as David as like, you know, poking something in there and starting something that A, we wouldn't be able to finish or, you know, to, to just really kind of make things worse. Um, and then, you know, speaking even with like the Molly story, um, what you guys saw on television um, was just a small part of like that. Like, you know, you guys can do your own research, but you know, that story was really kind of crazy um, from start to finish. And it involved like her mother-in-law and, you know, she, she ended up being cursed at one point. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. So some of that no, stuff did not. No, no research on their own, Chris. We're here to reveal <laughs> untold stories <laughs> from ghosts. Okay. Great. Stories. All right. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, Molly was cursed while she was, you know, bleeding out her entrails literally coming out of her stomach in that back alley. Um, so, you know, I think the story is a bit uncomfortable too, you know, because there was, there was this element of, of, uh, you know, of her being cursed and, you know, what did that, did that actually mean? But who something? cursed her? Explain it, that part of the story because that's heartbreaking to me. So it was her mother-in-law. So Molly was a prostitute, but she was married. She was married. And mm -hmm. this woman's mother-in-law, you know, after she was found, the coroner or the, uh, at the time, I guess the coroner, you know, 19 something, 1920s, I mm -hmm. think this was happened. Um, you know, before they took her body, <laughs> she got in on top of her and cursed her. Um, I forgot what the words were. She had. She was you like, know, it was "You in, deserve this, right?" Yeah, she's basically. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was in the paper what it, what was exactly said verbatim, but you know, I think I think Ellen was worried about that too. You know, mm -hmm. you know, bringing Molly into into uh, what was happening and 
kind of, you know, disturbing whatever that was. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's that's my theory. I I agree, it's and I of, think that yeah. in that aspect, you know, I mean, it's, that shows you that, you know, you hear the story. Molly steps in to try to stop a violent act from happening to a friend of hers, to, to a pregnant prostitute. She steps in, tries to calm the situation and ends up catching the blade herself and, yeah. and dies there. And, and it's that in itself is tragic enough. You've got this reluctant hero who does something to try to help. And she saves, as we mentioned in this, not just one, but two lives that day. And then the, the tragedy compounds itself when somebody who's kind of related to her, doesn't come for comfort, doesn't hold her hand to help ease her to the other side. She kind of spits out this venom of, you know, you get exactly what you deserve and my son deserved better than you. Just this pure hatred. And you could understand why a spirit like that might want to stay, or at least a fraction of that spirit might want to stay to, to make sure that no other woman, no other patron of that building would ever feel that's that sense of abandonment and, and terror again. And, um, you know, I think they're, you know, I think the, the, the consensus was that they're there kind of protecting the space also from from something else. Right. Well, and, and, uh, I've noticed a lot of times uh, uh, location, people who are who get attached to a location and the spirits at that location. Um, a lot of times they're they probably wouldn't tell you most times, but they're reluctant to see those spirits, those spirits move on or, you know, so a lot of times they're worried that uh, like like you say, Chris, uh, like we're going to come in and do something to mess it up and we're not going to be there to like clean the mess up or but also like uh, this that they've become friends for you know uh, pretty much with with whatever these spirits are, whoever these spirits are that are, are there. So yeah. they, I mean, it's like a friendship, like they don't want to see their loved ones leave or something, or they're worried for their safety, what's on the other side or whatever. Yeah. Th this episode affected Cindy in a way as well that I was, I was glad to see that production cut out. Um, because the tragedies that happened there time and time again, um, and the deaths that took place there, you could see were taking their toll on Cindy because you, know, you go into a place and there's a murder or there's a tragic death, one, this place is layered in that. And and Cindy was definitely emotionally impacted. And she has a big heart and she's caring. And you could see that she was at points carrying the weight of the world on her shoulder in this in this location. I was worried for her. Uh, I'm glad Katie, Katie, let's just, I think Mad Scientist, the paranormal, we need to rebrand you. You've got to be the uh, electronic medium. Uh, because your connections and communication like is amazing, uh, and and the way that you get that coming out, you're you're tuned into the location, you're tuned into what's happening. What's interesting is there were aspects of stories that you were getting simultaneously while Cindy was picking them up upstairs. Stories that were just too horrific to talk about on TV, and definitely a trigger. And and I don't want to go into those here, even though I I say we tell you some of the behind the scenes story. Trust me. Uh, my little darklings, there are some aspects of the history there you don't want to know because of the brutality that was displayed to the uh, to the employees there throughout history. So yeah, it's exactly. it's a tough yeah. yeah, it's 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 a tough story to deal with and to go in and be in that environment is really weird. Um I'm glad we got a chance to do that. And then we're gonna talk about Rosemary. We have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we can't go further without discussing what happened to Rosemary, her mother, their paranormal uh, meeting, and then what it took to get her back in to the Dumas brothel. So stay tuned. We're going to discuss that. Uh, first, let's take a quick peek at uh, what you can expect in next week's episode. Next on Ghosts of Devil's Perch. I have nightmares about a man in my closet. My son has also mentioned seeing something in his closet. He says, I'm coming for you. Something is terrifying this family. We've never seen anything like that. This may be the most dangerous case of all. Sounds 
Urban's Edge Tattoo Aftercare is the first ethically sourced, all-natural, vegan, and organic tattoo care line on the market. All of our products are formulated by leading experts in the skincare industry and are developed especially to nourish, enhance, and preserve your tattoos. Our tattoo enhancing balms are non-greasy and the perfect consistency for daily use. They're absorbent, hydrating, restorative, and are guaranteed to bring life back into your artwork. Visit www.urbansedgetattoo.com to order your starter kit today. That's www.urbansedgetattoo.com. Hey, it's Chris Jericho here just reminding you about the Four Leaf Clover. Chris Jericho's rock and wrestling rager at sea, the fourth voyage, leaving February 2nd from Miami to Great Stirrup Key, our very own private island. This is going to be the biggest and best Jericho cruise ever with the biggest lineup, the most fun, I guarantee it. Come join us for the vacation and the party of a lifetime. ChrisJerichoCruise.com. Cabin's still available. I want to see you there. Wanted Magazine, issue 35, is out 6th September, featuring the feminine macabre, vampires, the Gold Camp Road, Jamaica Inn, ESP, Australia's spookiest spectres. Richard Estep investigates Shepton Mallet Prison. The Roswell Incident, 75 years on. The Burden of Lizzie Borden by Sam Baltrusis. The Seminal Ghost Watch hits 30. Plus an in-depth chat with ghost hunter Barry Guy. Order in print from the Haunted Magazine website or visit WH Smith in the UK, Barnes & Noble in the US, and outlets in Canada and Australia. It's also available in the app stores. And remember, don't be normal, be paranormal. you want your own paranormal 60 protection and energy bracelet email me dave at paranormal 60.com and we will send you a link so that you can order that and get it taken care of we will ship them out immediately uh please be patient i am in scotland this week but i will be forwarding those emails over to make sure that those orders are being fulfilled but get yours now it's a great time to pick them up for the holidays right around the corner so if you're again looking for the paranormal 60 protection and healing bracelets we've got those available for you let's get back into it as we are talking about the most recent episode of the ghosts of devil's perch which was help us taking place at the dumas brothel uh i mentioned rosemary and her husband addison had come to the brothel they had had an experience there on a smaller investigation and it felt as though uh these two women felt attacked from the minute she started telling me the story and the way this thing kind of ushered them out, I, I got more of the sense that something was trying to help them get out or deeply encouraging them <laughs> to get out of that basement area uh, because there was something much darker and preying on the people that have, have come to visit. And I was a little surprised how, I mean, I know we put in the request, would Rosemary come back in with us with her husband in the, the little interview time I had with them? Was Rosemary difficult to convince to go back in, Chris, or was she open as long as her husband was there? Uh, difficult isn't the word. She was very hesitant. You know, yeah. she was. Well, and I don't mean difficult in the way that oh, uh, she was a diva. I just meant was yeah, no, no, no. Very... Yeah, I mean, it was. You know, there was there was an element of you know. She, I mean. She definitely wasn't going to go in there by herself. So you right. Know, that was like point blank, not happening. Not that we'd ask her to do that, but um, yeah, whatever. What happened to her there was very frightening and disturbing to her. And you know, her husband had to be on site. 
for sure. Um, yeah, there were definitely stipulations on on her going back in, but you know, she ultimately wanted to help and 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 trusted that nothing bad was going to happen to her. Now we talk again. Now about I don't, don't know if anything. Sorry, <laughs> I'm glad no. nothing bad did happen to her. We can't control right. the uncontrollable, but right now. Obviously, we had to have a, a team meeting about, do we bring this woman in? A, do we subject her to this situation? But what a lot of people forget is in a paranormal investigation, um, a lot of investigators go in and change the parameters. Some black out windows or move things or remove things. And if you truly want an experience, you kind of want to have everything as it was so that you can, A, is it attached to this person b is this person the focal point of the energy and the attacks um by just going in without rosemary we're left with a lot of questions by bringing her in we get an opportunity to see is she a battery to this what's going to happen so we had that discussion uh, you know and after we had her in there and we were starting to hear stuff move around you could see she was uh emotionally um charged by what was happening just in that little interview section we had the conversation again well what if we brought her in just the two of us to go down there i wanted i wanted so much to empower her again because i believe that those spirits were really there more as a protective shield for her than they were some terrifying thing and i know her mother was pushed but i think i still maintain to this day i think that they were pushed out of that basement for a very good reason i think that molly quinn was trying to get them out of there because of that darker male presence that still walks those halls. And there are some interesting elements. And that's one that I am going to encourage people as a historian, um, go research the Dumas brothel and some of the deaths there. And you may figure out who we believe this male presence is. Now this person still has family and friends, and we have to be very cautious with how we represent parts of the story because we're not detectives. We don't have DNA. We can't prove that this took place or that a murder happened here or abuse happened because we don't have any physical evidence, but we do have what the spirits are telling us. And we have this spirit showing up soon after the death of somebody in that building. So you could do a little research for yourself and, and see if your uh, concepts match up with ours. And, and again, sometimes we have to play a little coy uh, because we are dealing with, with, you know, Butte's got generations of families that still live there. And if you start throwing people's names into a mix and maybe there was murder, maybe there was some corruption, you have to be really cautious so that you're, A, not opening yourself up for a lawsuit, but you also don't want to besmirch somebody's good name on a yeah. hypothesis. Yeah. So that was, was that was a tough, yeah. It was tricky, especially um, at the Dumas brothel. Um, mm -hmm. There were a lot of stories there and there was a lot of, of what you guys are finding that possibly could have gone in that direction. But again, you know, we had to be very, very careful on what stories we were going to tell uh, right. for those reasons. I'll bet it was yeah. that way, like through the whole season though, like kind of with Butte because it's like a, it's a small town, but not a small town. So it's like a lot of times the same, uh, you know, names will pop up and. Yeah. Well, yeah. even in the Fink family episode, we realized that one of the former owners there were reports of, of physical abuse and things that had mm -hmm. taken place. And we were, you know, kind of wondering and theorizing, could this female spirit be attached to that? Could this angry male spirit be this guy? So we had to find ways to kind of gently mention it because, you know, we throw out a lot of names. We throw out a lot of things. So does Fisk, but we have to, again, mm -hmm. pair back on the episode because there's still family and friends of these people in town. And if all of a sudden we're saying, Hey, OJ did it and we don't have the glove <laughs> and we don't have the knife and we don't, you know, that that's not good for anybody. So we, we, we do have to make it a very delicate uh, conversation. And there were times Fisk too was like, guys, I know where you're going with this. And I think you may be onto it, but man, there's still deep ties here and you have to be really careful. So not saying that there's, darkness and corruption but you know children and grandchildren of people that we're talking about and and they may not know those aspects or those concerns and uh mm -hmm. you know the, the watching it on a tv show may not be the way to uncover 
those secrets about your family. So it's, it is a tricky business to walk on and it isn't that you, the viewer don't deserve to know the truth. It's that we have to be cautious of what the truth is and we can't put forth something because it seems to fit the narrative. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's tough. And there are other shows that'll jump on it and run uh, full bore. And uh, you've, <laughs> you know, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. That's all those slander but, cases. Yeah, exactly. So you've got to be super cautious with the way that's handled. Rosemary was emotional. I um, I felt for her. She has that nervous plastered smile in a lot of the scenes where you could see she's like, yeah, let's go back in. And you could tell, it's like, <laughs> oh, God, let's not go back in. She yeah. got very emotional during the. Well, she also the, that, she also yeah. kind of stepped up and was like, "Hey, who's in? Who's out in the hallway out there?" Yeah, so she did kind of take charge and you know, like uh, showed that she wasn't a coward at least. Yeah. And I appreciate the 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 episode really kind of highlighted her her strength because you know, right. again, we were there. You know, we saw how nervous and scared she was, and you know, I don't even think the episode really even highlighted too much of that you know but she did kind of muscle through it so kudos to her it's it's almost a shame that we couldn't film well we filmed but that we couldn't show what was going on with her husband at the time because things were so it, it's such a dense comprehensive episode with so many stories um we made her husband sit out in the rv with kd um because I didn't want another strong, aggressive male in there making the spirits feel afraid to come forward. And he is a very protective force over his wife. What was it like, Katie, as you guys are watching this play out on the display monitors in the RV, and he's watching his wife physically and emotionally kind of getting um, frightened by what's happening? Did you, Were you afraid at some point you're going to have to tackle the guy to keep him from running inside? Yeah, I thought I, I thought I might have to hit him off at the door out of the camper a couple times. No, he was he was uh, obviously you know distressed seeing his wife, uh, you know, in that situation and coming back to those same feelings that she experienced the last time he was ran out, right? And uh, you know, he he knows the the severity of the situation when uh, she had her first experience, so. He was obviously um, distraught by the whole thing. But, you know, I told him, uh, you know, uh, we're not trying to use her as ghost bait, man. It's, it's not it's not like we're just dangling right. around, and, you know, but but it, it is part. Of, and, you know, he's uh, he's also he's has an interest in paranormal investigation as well. So right. he understands. And at the end of the day, I think he was he was um, he, he stepped up to the challenge of of just sitting back and also kind of letting her do her thing, you know, like, uh, giving her the, the freedom to go in if she wanted to. Right. Now we talk about things that you don't see on the episode. There are two major things that took place in that episode that you don't get really a chance to see. Uh, you can kind of tell because if you watch my glasses, you'll see blinking and flickering. We had a REM pod at the end of that hall mm -hmm. down in the area near wall where Molly had died. We were getting direct hits. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> I never walked my uh, spooked ass down that hall to get close to it to pick it up on the, the microphone, and the camera guys stick with me. So Rosemary and I stood so you couldn't hear the beeping. We had consistent conversation with that, which, I again, I kicked myself. It's one of those now I wish I would have walked down there so we would have had that moment. But I also felt like I didn't want to. It's very claustrophobic. It's a very small little hallway, and I didn't want to put Rosemary in a position where she felt like she had when she was there with her mother. And I'm going to stick with that as my answer and not the fact that I was afraid to be down in that tunnel. Um, but we're dealing with that. We were getting direct deal. But KD uh, is kind of an unsung hero on this series because he builds a lot of equipment and a lot of stuff doesn't get shown on the episode. You had this huge elaborate system set up in the yeah, basement. Yeah. Yeah. No, I brought, yeah. You know, we, we got a lot of things from it, but it was like... Um... I don't think it was anything that would directly help like this, uh, explain the situation. Right. So, um, right. it to go in and explain, it would have been, it was, it was kind of convoluted, but I just, I walked in and as soon as I, I walked in to that space in the basement, I just saw like a giant, it was like a giant reverb tank. And I was hearing voices from the end of the hall and they were vibrating through these pieces of tin that were stood up in the hall. So I just kind of, 
like uh, I built life, man. I did a lot of stuff. That was one of the that was one of the uh, episodes I put the most time into an experiment. Yeah. It just didn't show it at all. <laughs> and again, it, it's tough because what it's do okay, we take Chris, out I of that? You. It's a love. You. What, <laughs> what do we take out of the forty two minutes to show that elaborate setup? Because you do have to show it getting set up and kind of an explanation. But then we we lose part of the humanity of like, well, do we remove Rosemary's? You know, do we remove how uh, how impactful this is to Cindy? You know, there was there's so many things. And as you said, you got some great responses, but a lot of it was redundant to things you had already collected on other pieces of equipment that right. could succinctly tell the story. So, folks, yeah. editors even edit the ghosts, and they're like, "You're taking too long to tell the story. We're just going <laughs> to go with the the EVP yeah. that we got." That I. <laughs> Oh man, my heart broke for Rosemary when I kind of get her coming down and she's starting to feel like maybe these spirits are protecting her. And then, you know, are you protecting her from something? And then you hear that <laughs> come through that, that EVP. It was like a scream. Yeah. Her eyes welled up and tear started streaming. That's why I said, I'm going to get you out of here. And that was it. Because at that point, I have to respect her. I have to respect her husband. I, I, in the whole back of my head, I'm like, this guy's going to come through the door like the Kool Aid man to get his wife if I don't get her out of here. So we got her upstairs. Uh, we went back in. I, you know, it's it's hard to show again. The investigations are so long and comprehensive. Cindy was upstairs for almost two and a half, three hours mm -hmm. by herself. I was yeah. in the RV for two hours monitoring. You were out there with him monitoring for over an hour and a half with uh, while Rosemary and I were inside. Um, you were downstairs for like four or five hours setting up and running your experiments. Uh, then we all work together. So there's so much that just doesn't get into this for good reason. Um, sometimes we get some of the coolest evidence, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the story, right? You, you, you hear yeah. things, you can hear conversations, but it's not like it's giving us an insight into the story. It's just like, oh, we caught a moment in time right there. We could hear two people talking, but there it wasn't like, yeah, let's go in and kill them. It's like, hey, did you pick up our ham sandwiches today? Yeah, Larry, bring them over. You know, it's yeah. a basic kind of EVP that had nothing that pushes forward, but it's amazing pieces of, of evidence that don't get shown, uh, but have no ties to it. We had to deal with that on Holzer files. I know you had to deal with that on Morgan City. Um, but you, you have to understand that, you know, as cool as the evidence is, the episode's not just about evidence. It's about the evidence that is playing into the story and what what do we have that can corroborate what we're experiencing and if we don't we got to move on and it's heartbreaking watching you the time and effort you put into creating building running these experiments and then it didn't make it so that's why i wanted to make sure i mentioned that today because well, that you, that's Dave. a lot a lot of work man and you've got some cool stuff and i i, I hope that if we do get another season of this people uh hopefully we'll be able to get some cool evidence that shows what's going into this uh, experience overall. Yeah, I've got, I have um, ideas yeah. to help document that next time. If there's a cool. Next time. Yeah, well, let's see. Everybody has to keep tuning I mean, in. And remember, yeah. watch it in the first 24 to 48 hours. That's going to make sure that uh, shows like this stay alive. So go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, I mean, there should be a second season just because there was just, there's so much going on out there. I mean, mm -hmm. there were locations and things that were happening that we, we just did not have the time you know, to, to really kind of dig in. Um, so. Well, that and the fact yeah. KD are, KD and I are planning on retiring there together and opening up. <laughs> <right. laughs> We've got to finish a looking. Lovely town. Yeah. <laughs> uh, amazing place. Um, we've only got a few minutes left together. I want to show one more quick scene from the next episode of uh, Ghost of Devil's Perch. The episode aptly is called I'm Coming for You. And I will tell you, I can't wait to watch the episode. We don't get to watch the episodes until you, the viewers, get to watch the episodes. Mm -hmm. In totality, we get clips and scenes, and that's it. This, to me, was one of the more terrifying episodes because of the child involved in it, but let's watch this quick scene. I'm here to try to communicate with the spirit of Sam Lucas. Sam. Are you here with us? Sam, are you the spirit that keeps making its presence known to young Wesley. Sam, are you here to protect and watch over Wesley? Yes. 
is there something here with you that is trying to hurt or influence this family? We've got a, a great cast and crew, and I love in this moment. I've got uh, Jolly, our camera lead, camera guy, our uh, our uh, what what are they? Uh, love the Jolly, director he of photography. He's he's director yeah. photography. Yeah. He was the center photographer, right? He's amazing. Yeah, he's filming, and his eyes are getting bigger and bigger as we're getting these hits. And there, you know, I don't know if it's in the episode, but again, one of those creepy moments. It's in a dark room. This kid keeps seeing and hearing things in his closet. And I've got my recorder and I put my arm in the into the closet and kind of turn away from it, hoping that if I just a I want to make sure I'm not breathing in the direction of of my recorder. I'm trying to just eliminate as much as I can and I'm filming like this, but the whole time I'm just envisioning this Freddy Krueger hand grabbing <laughs> mine. So it gets unnerving when you're in these situations because I don't mean this rudely towards that child, but what was happening to Wesley is terrifying and his almost calmness of explaining it to me at points made my blood run cold. Yeah. That was more terrifying. Everybody's everybody's. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, I'm not in the house when it's going on, but I'm hearing what's happening and I'm just, I'm listening to this little kid just vividly and, you know, so clearly explain what is happening to him and this really calm, voice and you know again i'm not going to call him creepy he was a, he was a cute little kid lots of life yeah, he wasn't like a creepy kid He's no like, no 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 but the mo those moments were just again it made my hair stand up listening to him talk about what was happening so i'm actually really excited to see this episode it's first those are the first clips that i've seen too so well, uh, and in this in this episode i think <laughs> if if it's all shown out in its entirety and they could fit it in i think you get to see a uh, an awakening moment for one of uh, Butte's finest when uh, I don't want to give it away, but what, what <laughs> unfolds uh, somebody, somebody there that's been kind of a skeptic on the fence post gets really weirded out by it. So we'll watch that episode. We'll talk about it and, and go into that one more in depth. Uh, Chris, that we've worked together a couple seasons on different shows. You've been yeah. in the field, you've been there working this. What is the, what was the standout from these first, five episodes that have aired now what is the standout creepiest experience for you um well i mean what happened to you was i don't even know if that was creepy that was just terrifying in in general because we didn't know what, what the hell was going on like in the middle of production you know you take a hit the way that you did and you know all of us were just kind of like or as katie puts it i got touched yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it was a good time. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> have you, oh, Chris, like, have you ever had, Chris, have you ever had a paranormal experience on set of any of these locations? Something that left you going, holy, I want to get out of here. So in the Clark Chateau, it was the very first, um, our, it was our first location that we landed at. And at one point, I had to go upstairs and grab a REM pod that was left behind, completely in the dark. Like, <laughs> um, and I'm not, it was more or less a feeling than, you know, I didn't see anything, but I was upstairs on that third floor. I mean, you're literally away from everybody. And there was just this feeling of somebody else in the room with me, you know, and, and there was nobody else there. You know, I, I know that for a fact. It was one of those like I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty good at just going and doing what I need to do. And it was one of those things that made me kind of stop and like look around and then hightail it the heck out of there. So um but the Hennessy Mansion was probably the creepiest. And I think Cindy between Cindy's reaction in room seven and then what happened to you in the basement, um that house was again that was another house where you guys don't even see the scope of how big how massive this place is um and you felt kind of the heaviness in that house so yeah yeah, yeah. Agreed. all right well remember to watch the show folks it's every sunday night on discovery plus and travel 
You can watch a show and I do live tweet uh, during the show as best I can to answer your questions. Make sure you use hashtag ghosts of devil's perch so that I see them. And uh, eventually we'll get KD out of the bat cave and get a, a Twitter account <laughs> so he can tweet along with us um, and, and see if we can do that. KD, anything cool coming up? We can let everybody know about where are you going to be? How can people come out and meet you? I know you've got some ghost hunts and some there live is a, well, well, we do have an event in uh, Joplin. It's uh, it's gosh darn it. Okay, if you go to our Supernatural Link page, uh, you'll see it there. But uh, we will be attending an event in Joplin, Missouri, and uh, that's the next one we have coming up. And then we'll also be at the Pythian Castle in Missouri, and um, yeah, some other places. Uh, just go to the page; it's all on there. There's a, a link what? down on today's program guide. You can find it. How to keep up with uh, KD? Order some of his equipment. Find tickets to these events and be a part of it. Chris. My brother, I love you. I, I love the work that you do with us. So thank you so much for the great work you've done. Love you, Chris. Love you too, guys. Thank you so much for having me, Dave. It's fun. This is my second and time on the show. So thank you. Look at this. And this may not be the picture that, that you, you want me to show, but this is the picture that I always think it's of. The sexiest think ghost I've ever seen. I love that it. Is. Look I at love it. Yes. <laughs> me and you in front of uh, the Clark Chateau. That's yes. right. Uh, all right. We will be back. We've got um, a special episode this week because I'm in Scotland on Friday. There'll be no news, but Patty Negri and the Witch's Brew, we talk about manifestations and have a great little uh, concise conversation. I hope you guys will check that out. That's this Friday. It is a Freaky Friday edition where the roles have been reversed. So check that out. I will be back with you next week. And uh, guess what? My special guests for next week's episode that's right, the Paranormal News crew themselves. They get to come in and pick me apart after watching the first six episodes. We're going to talk about the episodes. We're going to talk about uh, the the creepy, creepy episode you guys are about to see next week. So make sure that you tune in for another edition of our recap special as well. And uh, we'll be back to entertain, enlighten, and educate you more on the paranormal. I'm Dave Schrader. You've been listening and watching the best in paranormal entertainment this is the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader.